All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Harold Moritz. I'm glad to be here after a three-year delay to give my talk on the minerals and quarries of Haddam, Connecticut. And, you know, why is Haddam something worth talking about? Well, this goes back a couple hundred years at least. And I'll use the words of a traveling doctor, uh, Frederick Hall, who in 1838 wrote that I took passage to New York or at New York yesterday in a steamboat bound for Hartford. And I could not pass by Haddam, a place known all over civilized earth for the richness and variety of its mineral productions. I therefore begged the captain to put me on shore that I might have the pleasure of spending a few days in rambling among the rocks and examining the fine quarries of granite and gneiss. Uh, thousands of tons of stone have already been worked out here and prepared for the builder's hand, waiting to be transported to New York and other more southern markets. A tall order indeed. And why is that? Well, uh, Haddam has a lot of rugged terrain and plenty of open space, as this uh, LIDAR topography map shows. And uh, there's a lot of bedrock outcrop here. And it's crossed by the Connecticut River, which in the 19th century was, of course, a major highway for, for heavy products, or all kinds of products, really, as well as the old Middlesex Turnpike along the river and, and other new highways. And if we switch to geological view, uh, Adam has a mix of a lot of different metamorphic and igneous uh, bedrock types and formations. Uh, most of them are oriented vertically and or oriented north-south, which is kind of basically parallel to the uh, glacial ice flow back in the Ice Age, so that uh, most of the units were uh, not, uh, were their exposure was enhanced by that uh, northward ice movement. Uh, this led to extensive dimension stone quarrying, as shown in the uh, S's here. Uh, there was numerous quarries up in the northern eastern part of the town called Haddam Neck uh, across the river uh, on Quarry Hill. And then south of the river on Great Hill and on Long Hill. And notice they're all clustered uh, within a couple of different formations here. These quarries tended to uh, expose peg small pegmatites that were oriented east-west as they cut through the rock that trended north-south. Uh, but several pegmatites were relatively large and were quarried for feldspar and gems. Uh, collectively, they produced many fabulous tourmaline quartz, barrels, columbite, microlite, fluorite, almadine topaz, lorapatite crystals, and cernicite, which is something we'll talk about. And two of the best pegmatites in Connecticut, Gillette and Hewitt, shown here in red, are found in Haddam. And one of these was among the best in the United States. And mineral localities, there you add up the, the pegmatites, the, the stone quarries, and other places, uh, you end up with 132 valid minerals on Mindad right now. And even within the metamorphic rocks, there are things like anthophyllite, epidote, cordierite, magnetite, and spezertine. And we have two, what I'm calling here in quotations, first localities, and I'll explain why later, uh, for columbite and chrysoberyl, plus a, a unique hydrothermal quartz vein. Much of this stuff came out of the ground in the 19th century, early 20th century. And we know a lot about it because of its Haddam's proximity to Wesleyan and Yale universities. And many things were written up in American Journal of Science. So we can still read that easily now online. So stone quarrying was big in Haddam. And what makes a good stone quarry? Why was Haddam a good place? Well, you know, obviously you need abundant and competent hard rock, but it should also be visually aesthetic. It shouldn't stain over time or crumble. And it should be easy to split uh, at the quarry site into blocks and slabs and dressed into pieces uh, needed for market. Uh, the, if the layers are naturally oriented vertically, then it's even more, uh, convenient for their removal, plus a minimal amount of waste rock. And it should be located close to transportation so that you know you can clearly move these heavy things to market. All of these conditions were met by rock found along what's called the Allen vein and on Quarry Hill. And so what is the Allen vein? Well, this was the geographic trend of the best quality dimension stone and named for quarryman David Allen. And it's a north-south trend through the summit of Great Hill, across Mill Creek, and onto Long Hill. Geologically, a, ver a vertically layered bay tight gneiss uh, mapped as the Upper Middletown Formation. It used to be volcanic ash, was metamorphosed uh, 
to uh, amphibolite grade. It dates back 450 million years. Similarly, on Quarry Hill to the north, uh, here the rock's more of a biotite hornblende gneiss, uh, named the Kelsey Hill Complex. Again, dates about 450 million years old. Um, Charles Shepard recognized this when he did his uh, classic report on the Geological Survey of Connecticut, the first real statewide survey, where he said the quarries of gneiss on the Connecticut River rank very high in importance not only on account of the intrinsic excellence they possess, but from their proximity to the river. At Haddam, no rock precisely resembles it in any part of the state. Its minerals are arranged in thin, straight, and parallel layers. Slabs of any dimension are easily procured, and its great use seems to be for flag and curbstones, though it is also employed extensively in the construction of wharves, bridges, breakwaters, and fortifications, for which purposes its strength and inalterability render it very desirable also used for underpinning stones, gateways, fences, and paving, extensively in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and even as far as Charleston and New Orleans. Um, the stone for quarries here started on Great Hill in 1762, I'm sorry, on Quarry Hill, and then later on Great Hill in 1794. These are some of the earliest stone quarries in the area. And Gulf and Long Hill quarries worked later in the 1800s. It got to be very popular stone such that other quarries had to be opened uh, off of the Allen vein, which led to some complaining, as you can imagine. Eventually, all these rocks, though, were replaced by concrete and asphalt and brick products, as is the case, you know, everywhere in the world, really. By 1900-ish, none of these quarries will appeared in a survey of, in 1911 for the Granites of Connecticut. They were all abandoned. Uh, although recently a fellow named Dwayne Brooks has uh, revived some quarrying on Great Hill. Uh, here's a quick aerial view, uh, in this case, north is to the left. Uh, and you can see the north-south trend of quarries here on the Allen Vein in Adam, uh, which is, uh, I should point out, still a very rural place, not a whole lot different uh, than it was in the uh, early 19th century. There's about 7,200 people there now, which is only about three times as much as there was uh, 200 years ago. And similarly, across the river on uh, Haddam Neck on Quarry Hill, the quarries are more like uh, walls that extend for uh, uh, hun uh, hundreds of meters with many other small ones scattered around. To go up to uh, Quarry Hill is a nice uh, open space preserve where you can hike along these faces. Uh, hard to get pictures now with all the trees, but as you sure you can understand. But uh, this view looking perpendicular to the, to the uh, quarry face shows the, the vertical uh, layering and how easy it would be to, to peel these apart and drop them down. Uh, again, here another quarry showing the same kind of thing. There's a lot of slabs laying around that were pulled down and left uh, or extra waste pieces like shown here. Uh, it was mostly a very slabby rock. So it made great uh, facing material and the bigger pieces went into fortifications. But this is my favorite picture of, of a piece of waste showing the, the centimeter scale layering uh, from the intense shearing that this rock underwent uh, during its metamorphism. There was a big uh, fort building period after the War of 1812 uh, along the coastal cities. And uh, Adam Stone went to many places, especially because there was no hard rock really along the coast uh, south of New York City. Uh, this is an example from Fort Hamilton in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, after the quarries die, they get overgrown very quickly. Here's some photos uh, of the quarry on Great Hill in 1932. Uh, on the left, we're looking straight down the Allen vein, for example. But you can go around Haddam and see uh, many buildings and walls and structures uh, made from uh, Great Hill Stone. This is a famous building that was used to be the Brainerd Academy. Now it's Town Hall. And you can see the care that was taken to arrange the stones, small and large. I especially like the uh, details on the edges of the walls, the corners. And you can see that again in... Uh, this building, which used to be the county jail, uh, and which is not right down the hill from, from Great Hill. And um, 
other places uh, you can find it, the sidewalk slabs and as uh, pillars here, the entrance to a park and stone walls at some of the cemeteries around the area, as well as some of the hitching posts that are still there. So let's jump from stone quarrying to feldspar quarrying, uh, basically for microcline for back in the day for ceramic glaze, et cetera. And this was big industry in the 19th century, early 20th century, all over Connecticut. We're looking at really the southern end of the what's called the Middletown uh, Pegotite Mining District here. These are the southernmost uh, quarries in that district. Uh, these are all the ones that occurred in Haddam and their names. Uh, we have a pretty good history on most of them. And it, as I mentioned before, the smaller pegmatites that cross cut the, the stone, uh, the metamorphic rocks were basically left uh, as waste at the stone quarries. But you can get an, an idea here how the white microcline uh, was pretty easily hand cobbed out of the, 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 uh, the quartz from, from the pegmatites. Uh, sometimes they just left the pegmatite standing as a vertical wall like this one, which is 15 feet above the quarry floor. Uh, but a lot of it ended up in these dumps uh, up there on Quarry Hill, uh, which were basically because a lot of this was just a nuisance to the stone quarriers. Uh, one place I did find actually still uh, uh, an ore pile of hand cobbed grade one feldspar which was staged uh, for shipment and uh, never happened. This is on a small quarry in an isolated place. I I've never seen this anywhere else in New England. I think as places closed, they just scarfed it up from somewhere else, but I was very surprised to see this still, still there. It was just, uh, most of these quarries are fairly small as a typical of the 19th century. This is uh, the Smith quarry wall. Uh, and there were two feldspar mills in town, one on, uh, in, in the northern part of town in, in Haddam Neck, uh, which started in 1917 called the Tidewater. It was, it was built right on the Connecticut River. And it, it took stone from the Rock Landing Quarry, which was uh, not quite a mile north, and uh, probably from some other small quarries in the area as well. Apparently it got hit hard by the Depression. So in January 31, it was auctioned off sold and then supposedly equipment was going to be installed in 32 but uh it does appear in, in the 1934 aerials which are the first available but disappears shortly after that uh i think it might have fallen victim to the hurricane of 1938 which caused a lot of flooding and it's not even mentioned in uh, the usgs world war ii era report on new england pegmatites so it kind of came and disappeared and most people don't even know it even existed now uh, there are some ruins there, but not much. Here's what it looked like in 1934 on the river. Um, this quarry that over on the left there that says not opened was where that ore was stored. There was the other mill in uh, the village of Higginham, which was more of the mill town part of Adam. And this was uh, the Higginham Spar Mill built in 1866. Uh, again, for grinding feldspar and what they called back then flint, not the stone you think, but massive quartz. Uh, flint and spar were uh, uh, trade names for um, quartz and, and feldspar back in those days. Uh, the quarries for it were written not very well described. They were, they were called above here, which I take to meet into the hills. Uh, there's a couple of ones near a place called Miller's Pond State Park that uh, don't have any documented history for. So I think that must have been what fed these, this uh, mill rather. Eventually it was sold to the Scoville Hoe Works in 1877, which was still there, uh, but it was definitely gone before 1934. Uh, we do have this nice photo though from 1877, typical mill pond and uh, mill structure. Yeah, and here's uh, the 34 aerial showing those two unnamed quarries over by Miller's Pond, uh, which probably fed this mill. This is what they look like today, typical overgrown uh, cuts. So the, uh, most of the remaining places in town are mineral localities. Uh, and so we'll talk about one that's a little different from the rest, the Long Hill Quartz locality. Uh, this is a place where a, uh, a brittle fault cut across a quartzite, and brecciated it, and uh, 
that was hydrothermally mineralized. It's very similar to the Stafford Springs and Moosip localities in Connecticut, which some people may have heard about, but not nearly as well known or accessible. This is on private property like most places. Uh, the pieces were laying on the ground back in the day. Um, the uh, the first appears on this little old map from uh, which was published in American Journal of Science in 1825. Uh, localities of minerals on the Connecticut River, and I and I think our traveling Dr. Hall, we heard from earlier, probably carried this map with him, because many of the localities shown here are in Haddam, including the the crystal barrel place we'll talk about. Uh, notice it says large crystals quartz um, on a spot, which good luck trying to find that <laughs> using this map, but it can only be the uh, quartz locality we now know. Uh, and these are the large crystals he's talking about. This one being 25 centimeters. Uh, a fellow named James Davis, who we have a lot to thank for writing about the minerals of Haddam in 1900, and we'll see quotes from him all through this, wrote that on Long Hill, about two miles southeast of the railroad station, well-defined crystals of large size are found loose in the soil. Uh, many are doubly terminated and perfectly transparent. And here's just a page showing uh, multiple hand uh, specimens from that locality. Completely different from anything else going on in town, but very similar to the other quartz places from Mesozoic Brittle Falls in Connecticut. I like the reverse scepters, which were particularly uh, rare from there. This brings us to, as we're since we're in the 19th century mostly here, uh, to a fellow named Nathaniel Cook. He started out as a, a guy working in the quarries, but eventually became basically a mineral collector and dealer. Um, and he sold mineral specimens from several famous Adam localities. Uh, to local museums, uh, many of which probably came from him. Of course, they usually just labeled Haddam without a specific locality, which makes sometimes finding their provenance uh, a bit difficult. But we don't have any image of him like I can find, but we have a couple of descriptions. Uh, James Davis said that Nathaniel Cook, who worked in the quarries and later made his living by mining minerals exclusively, it has been said that hunters would often come across rocks covered with tallow where he had secretly worked nights. Nothing has changed in terms of mineral locality secrecy. Miss um, Phila Parmalee in, in the, the 1800s wrote that the rather small, decidedly drab colored ferret eyed little man I distinctly remember was to every one of his neighbors known as Nat Cook. One of the things was, or said when he told a big tale was, oh, that's one of Nat Cook's stories. He was the village Baron Munchausen. Uh, this is his house uh, today, which uh, appropriately is a residence of geologist Bob Winch. Uh, it was it's on the it was on the Underground Railroad. His son John participated in uh, John Brown's 1859 infamous raid at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, and was hanged. Um, that's why the historical society knows a lot about his son, but not a lot about Nat Cook, unfortunately. <laughs> in any case, uh, some of the famous places that he collected at include what we're going to call the first Columbine locality, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, he probably collected at the Chris Barrel locality. Don't know that for sure, but it's kind of, I can't imagine why not. Uh, Tim's Hill, Cordierite, and Shorrell we'll talk about as we'll talk about Quarry Hill Barrel locality. And then there's this James Wakeley Shorrell Tourmaline Prospect, which um, has no further documentation that I've been able to find other than what I posted here. Uh, the others are well known because they they appeared in AJS, but um, the, the Tourmaline Prospect was written about by James Davis, who said, the most interesting shore locality is on the property of the late James Wakeley, where it has been mined by the late Nathaniel Cook many years ago, specimens sent all over the country. The writer has seen specimens taken out of this mine as brilliant as polished pieces of jet fresh from the lapidary's hand. They are, as a rule, of considerable size, weighing several pounds, which, so I've never seen a piece I can know that I can attribute to this locality, so maybe you have to do some more research. Um, but let's talk about this first Columbite locality. Um, there's a small unquarried pegmatite in Haddam, shown by the M here, uh, that's very rich in Columbite and barrel. And keep in mind, this was not a quarry, but an outcrop. And long ago, there was a heavy crystal, a dark heavy crystal, found by Connecticut's first governor, John Winthrop, in the 17th century. He was an early New England miner, and he scoured uh, the land looking for iron and gold. And he did mine gold not far from Adam. 
but the location of this dark crystal was only vaguely documented. His catalog says a black mineral, very heavy. And I added the emphasis here from the inland parts of the country. Um, he had an estate in New London. People think maybe it was from there, but there's no Columbia from there. Um, so anyway, it sat around for a long time before it was analyzed by Hatchet in 1801. And he found a new element in it named, he named Columbium, which later got changed to Niobium. Um, after that, the hunt for more of it and other elements uh, was all the rage in the 19th century, as you may recall. Um, so where Winthrop got it from, well, there were no pegmatite quarries active at all uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, so it must have come from an outcrop. Um, and it must have been from a place where columbites are large and obvious. And I don't know of any, many places like that, except for this place in Haddam. Uh, on the left, by the way, are two renderings. One is uh, the crystal shown by Sow in Sowerby's 1811 Exotic Mineralogy, that meaning just minerals not from Britain. Um, and at the bottom left is a photo of it from the British Museum's website. Um, and I'll point out, this is an interesting uh, piece of trivia. In the world, there are only a very few objects known where we can point to and say the first uh, element known or um, it's the first thing that a specific chemical element was identified from. So that crystal is the first thing that columbium or niobium was ever found in. And if you go through the periodic table, there's actually not that many of those uh, things, specific objects you could point to that have that, uh, that claim. In any case, so, uh, the, the locality we know about, which I think is probably the first columbite locality, which we can't prove, but... Um, there's some, uh, here's a little bit of history of it. Uh, of course, Hatchet analyzed this crystal in, in 1801, not knowing where it's from. Um, but once it was named, people went looking for it. And Charles Shepard, who discovered tiny crystals of it at the Crystal Barrel locality in Haddam in 1822. Um, then more crystals turned up at a Feldspar quarry in Middletown. Uh, and then a little while later, Governor uh, Winthrop's 17th century catalog was actually published. And within a couple of years, we know that Nat Cook was specimen mining this outcrop, which was on the Heber Brainerd estate in Adam. So it's it's interesting how within a short time of uh, Winthrop's catalog being published, uh, that this outcrop was being specimen mined, though I don't know if Cook had any way of knowing that this might have been the place that the first one came from. In any case, uh, that locality was first described in detail by a Canadian named Hunt. In 1852, where he said, Columbite, here described as from a locality in Haddam in which the mineral was recognized by myself uh, six years ago. It occurs some two miles from the famous locality in Chrysoberyl, of Chrysoberyl. Notice in Haddam, everything is two miles from somewhere because there are very few landmarks, even today. Anyway, <laughs> where it was found in a huge granitic vein traversing Nice. And the barrel crystals there are four or five inches in diameter and a foot or two in length. So even the barrel from here is, is uh, something to talk about. Anyway, they're mostly subtranslucent brownish to greenish yellow, smaller crystals being topaz yellow or straw yellow. But some of the columbite were said to have been several ounces in weight, and a crystal procured by Professor Silliman Jr. weighs 36 ounces, which by any measure is a very large columbite. Uh, later, Davis said that columbite has been mined on land belonging to the Heber Brainerd estate, where it occurs in a coarse granite associated with colorless to light green transparent crystals, a barrel. Uh, many fine specimens were taken from here by Nat Cook and are seen today in Peabody Museum and other collections. So the, just the abundance of Columbia here um, and the fact that um, it's just an outcrop and that Governor Winthrop was, was in this area makes me think this is probably the place. Uh, this map showing where it is in relation to the estate and, and other localities in the area. Uh, if you go there now, it's actually in the state forest. You can actually get a permit to dig there with a mineral club. Uh, it's a very nice place. Uh, it's getting kind of picked over, but occasionally columbites still turn up. Uh, and here's the outcrop of what, what Hunt called nice. It's more of a ledge of a barren coarse grain granite. But there is a three to five foot wide, very coarse grain pegmatite vein that cross cuts it. And this is where uh, columbites can still be hand chiseled out, pain in the neck as it is, but 
and columbites do turn up when you do this. Uh, here's another example of a uh, more or less uh, soda can sized barrel from there matching uh, Hunt's description. And smaller ones, again, uh, th this was one of the earliest places where yellow crystals like this were, were abundant in North America. Uh, and some are very corroded. It, it's amazing how you, in this crystal alone, there are gem sections and there is totally corroded altered brown sections. And I've noted this as well. So this is definitely the place he was talking about. Uh, but as far as Columbite goes, again, um, Hunt said that uh, uh, Silliman's crystal was 36 ounces. This piece, which I got from, which was long ago, um, uh, deacquisition from the Michigan School of Mines, just labeled Haddam, weighs four and a half pounds, and it's a partial crystal. Uh, just to give you some idea, no other place in Haddam, or really anywhere in Connecticut I know of, produces crystals this big, um, uh, and, and, and there's such abundance for such a narrow vein. Here's a, a nice piece on display at, uh, that Wesleyan, simply labeled Haddam. And my favorite one here on the left, uh, over at the American Museum, just labeled Haddam again, uh, but really nice form on that one. Uh, and Hunt said that the smaller crystals were abundant and often perfectly or beautifully perfect. And uh, here's a couple examples of smaller ones, which is mostly what turns up these days. Columbite's one of my favorite minerals. I especially love the iridescence on, on a good crystal like this one on the right. So we heard mention of the Chrysoberyl locality, uh, two miles north of where we just were. Uh, this is the world's first find of Chrysoberyl in situ, but strangely not the type locality. Uh, what is this place? Well, uh, before 1810, Chrysoberyl, which of course is a very hard mineral, was very rare and it was known only from stream gravels in Brazil, where of course they were mining diamonds in. Yes, the official type locality is simply Brazil. So, okay, <laughs> not a place you can easily go and find another one. Um, but uh, Archibald Bruce found literally at this house in 1810, uh, crystal barrel in situ. The first locality really should be the type locality in my opinion, but eh, who am I? In any case, uh, blasting for specimen collecting went on here for decades in the 19th century, particularly the first half. Uh, that's all long stopped and it's long covered, but um, the famous crystal barrel here led to a later resident calling it crystal barrel knoll. Uh, our friend, the traveling Dr. Hall, went here and wrote that he had engaged a couple of quarry men for me to uh, blast at the famous crystal barrel locality. And he goes on to describe how they drilled holes and poured in uh, powder covered it up with planks, everybody went and hid, they blew the rock up they, and, and runs, big chunks went flying. But uh, in the end, they, the house was fine, except for a few broken planes of glass and he ended up with some good crystals. So this went on multiple times uh, actually. And there's a couple of, of, of uh, uh, passages similar to that in other publications. Uh, Benjamin Silliman even wrote that, and I, I love this quote, Mineralogists have found it necessary and just to ensure the proprietor of the house against their gunpowder blasts and to pay him liberally for the molestation of his piece. No word here on whether any insurance waivers were signed, obviously, but uh, the crystals are tabular, uh, sort of a lime green, yellow green like this, uh, almost all twinned. And I think even the Rochester Symposium logo might even come from here. I'm not sure. Um, this is a fairly large one here. And of course, Yale has a ton of specimens. Uh, this one was on display for a while. This is a six lane twin. Uh, also, spezzertine was common there as well, as was gonite and coriorite, by the way. Uh, but I mentioned earlier about the first columbite locality. People went looking for more columbite and Shepard found tiny crystals at the Chrysoberyl locality, and here's some uh, that I found inside some spezzertine. So while we don't know where the or where uh, Governor Winthrop's crystal first came from, this is the first place we do know documented that columbite was found in the U.S. after Hutch's description. 
So it is sort of another first in a sense, even if it isn't the very first place. They're all small here, so it couldn't have been the actual uh, place where uh, Winthrop found his. Tim's Hill, another place where Cook collected uh, some small pegmatites that yield uh, cordiorite mostly. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, this was became famous mostly as a gem locality. The crystals were kind of rough and somewhat altered as seen here. But Davis said that many beautiful specimens of clear blue color have been found and cut into gems, sent to various museums, of course. Uh, I like the little picture in the lower center there. That's at uh, Wesleyan. It's actually from a German op optician office and it has a knob where you can turn the little cut stone because it's cordyrite's dichroic and see the color change, which uh, I'll just show here in another example. Uh, so if you rotate it, it gives you two different colors. Other minerals found there are fallenite replacements of cordyrite, pseudomorphs, uh, lots of little doubly terminated chorals, and even magnetite. This one has shoal on it as well. Uh, and thophylite is an uncommon amphibole, very magnesium rich. Um, it's abundant in the Middletown formation, which is uh, covers a lot of Haddam. So pretty much anywhere that formation outcrops, you can find these, but this is a particularly good piece here because it's in a kind of a, sh um, a sugary quartz matrix. And uh, often is it's more in these uh, kind of feathery aggregates, but it's a uh, common, it's one of those things that kind of defines Adam metamorphically. The Quarry Hill Barrel locality was another place where Cook collected. Um, this was a, basically a large pocket in a pegmatite. Um, and produce these crystals shown here in various museums, uh, all of which are similar. And as described by Davis on the left, um, they were typically beautifully green with the exception of the cap at one end, which could have been a milky white color or sometimes clear. Uh, John Johnston, who wrote on the lower right here, he was at Wesleyan, he called them a milky mountain green, which I can see that in, 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 these, in these crystals. Uh, but the peculiar milkiness ceases near the terminal face where it, it has a uh, looks more like a veneer of green glass and window glass. These were found in 1837, 38 for a few years. None of these, uh, all these photos here, none of the, the places knew exactly where these came from until I'd read this. And, the one on the left is at Wesleyan, and there's drawings in the in the AJS that actually match that crystal. The other ones are at Harvard and at Peabody. I know only one private person who has a specimen, which I have yet to photograph, and I need to do that. But while we're in the area, these aren't at the, that place, but other minerals from Quarry Hill pegmatites. And this, again, these are from the, the pieces that were basically left as waste by the stone quarriers. Uh, can be found shoral and almondine and really nice crystals. There's a lot of this stuff. Uh, but rarely there's aquamarine and even small uh, pocket elbaites. Another mineral collector from Haddam was a fellow named Horace Williams, and he lived later than Cook uh, from 1867 to 1948. And he worked for the U.S. Geodetic Survey and was an assistant to uh, Professor Rice at Wesleyan. And he worked the at the Gillette Quarry, which we'll talk about in a minute. Where and he found many of the large Elbaite tourmalines known from there. He sold minerals from there to noted dealer George English and later traveled the world buying minerals for him. Eveline Brainerd uh, wrote uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, in 1899, Eveline Brainerd wrote about Haddam's quarries and minerals in her Connecticut Magazine article, Haddam Since the Revolution, based on stuff that uh, Horace Williams told her. Uh, one of his contributions was a map he made about 1945 and some text describing quarry locations and mineral locations in Haddam, which hung in the library for a long time. And this was the only source of information about names and places for many places in Haddam, which uh, not the uh, not the greatest document, but good enough. <laughs> so let's talk about the Gillette quarry. Uh, I mentioned earlier that they were two of the best pegmatites in Connecticut here in Adam, and this is one of them. Uh, and once a world-class locality as well. And it, it's a rare element pegmatite, otherwise it couldn't be world-class. Um, it's on the Connecticut River in Adam Neck. Uh, here's a 1934 aerial. 
and a, a map from the World War II era, uh, Pegmatite Investigations by USGS. Uh, why was this a great place? Well, it was opened in MP Gillette uh, in 1896 for feldspar, but unexpectedly produced many valuable minerals. Uh, and at this time, recall that the pocket elbaites were rare and found mainly at Mount Mica and in Southern California. And really, that's still kind of the case today for the most part. Uh, tourmalines and other perfectly terminated crystals were found in these pockets, which ranged up to six feet. Uh, mostly they were lined with smoky quartz. Uh, and other minerals would be standing on end or, and unattached to any matrix within the pocket debris. Uh, some pieces, pockets had 600 or more crystals ranging from needle size to pencil or larger. Uh, by 1900, many large crystals up to 12 inches were obtained and illustrated by USGS. Uh, at the left is George Kuntz's plate one from his 1899 precious stones. Uh, the long tourmaline shown there is from the Gillette quarry. Uh, many of these were marketed as coming from Maine, since that was well known, and also typical green crystals. But by 1922, Gillette was one of the best known localities in, in the United States. Uh, and of course, specimens are in personal in many public collections on display at American Museum, Yale, Harvard, Wesleyan, Field Museum, even in London. Uh, eventually, it was eclipsed by Elbaites from you know, Southern California and Brazil. And quarrying ended after World War II. Uh, and collecting was allowed for a time afterwards, but it's been closed for decades, unfortunately. I've only been there once myself. Here's a gallery of uh, specimens shown in museums uh, that have taken over the years. Uh, right now, American Museum has that big one on the left. They just redid their mineral exhibit, you may know, and the small one on the upper right. Uh, Yale's Peabody Museum is undergoing renovation. They used to have the one there on the left. And Harvard has uh, several uh, collections. Uh, Notice most of them are green with a color termination at the end, like this one that I have, uh, correct, collected about 1900, perhaps by Horace Williams himself. But there are pink crystals as well. Uh, they tend to be smaller uh, or mostly in terminal, uh, in a terminal position. Here's three views of a, a seven centimeter crystal I got at the Springfield show a couple of years ago. There's not many out there for sale anymore. If you see one, call me. <laughs> uh, most of the pockets had a lot of smoky quartz. If there were no Elbaites here, it would it would be a great location just for smoky quartz. Uh, but many of the quartzes are shot through with, with lots of tourmaline uh, Elbaite crystals. And there's this uh, thing I mentioned earlier called Chernikite. This is actually a, a fibrous variety of muscovite, slightly lithium, of course, colored by manganese. Uh, and the crystals either occur as individual fibers, usually within quartz crystals, or as aggregates and bundles that cleave, uh, that are in parallel growth, so they cleave collectively. And if you look at a, a, um, a cleavage face, you'll see all the little rhombic cross sections that produce a tessellated mosaic. So this is pretty characteristic. Uh, here are some of those bundles, and these can still be found in old collections. Uh, it was named for Ernest Chernikow, who leased the quarry around 1900, did collecting, and let people like our author Fred Davis collect there. Uh, often these things are stained, you know, brown, like a lot of things, and look like wood, but they clean quite easily. And in combination with Elbaite is very typical from here, as shown in uh, these pictures. It's not the only place it's known from now, but it's certainly probably the still the best place where it occurs. Other things in pockets there, fluorapatite was pretty abundant, uh, shown here in uh, both daylight and uh, shortwave UV, where usually fluoros is yellow. Uh, another famous thing from there is pink barrel. And these are not tabular crystals, they're usually prismatic, elongated rather, and they're actually overgrowths on a pale green earlier zone. Uh, pyramidal faces on these are very common in diagnostic of Gillette. Uh, of course, feldspar is there. There's some green tinted amazonite, not the greatest color, but still for Connecticut, pretty rare. As well as etched crystals, uh, often covered with cookite. 
and other goodies. Uh, Columbite, my friend, uh, they are only in small crystals, so it's not the uh, the Winthrop locality. Uh, topaz is also there. It's the only other place for topaz, really, except for the Trumbull localities, as well as chlorophane, uh, the red uh, green fluorescing variety of uh, fluorite. And many things have been uh, cut into stones from there, as shown here, mostly barrels, quartzes, um, and uh, tourmalines as well, and topaz. But lastly is uh, what I'm calling uh, Gillette Light. This is the small Ewitt gem quarry, which is very similar mineralogically. Um, and it's had a second best pegmatite and still one of the best in the state. And the best thing about it is it's still active. Uh, its history goes back to the 40s, but really it came into prominence when the Hewitt brothers bought it, Herb and Howard. How's that for alliteration? These guys were prospectors uh, and promoted themselves as shown here on the left. And eventually when they bought this place in the later years, um, were pretty much, they would work it for, for Gem Rough, but also became a, a well-known fee collecting site. And I, I like the flyer they made here on the right, which looks kind of like an old uh, uh, ransom note with things literally cut and pasted into it. None of the pictures are, are, you know, of specimens from there, but there are the minerals that occur there. But uh, $2, uh, that was probably kind of expensive for 1960s, <laughs> but I would pay it. <laughs> Here's uh, Howard and, and, and Herb back in 64 at the, uh, the quarry. I don't know what they're discussing there, but it must have been a barrel or something in that rock. Either that or just posing. Um, and Herb had a shack there. <laughs> which is long gone, uh, but we still know the name of his dog. Uh, this is probably about half of the quarry right here, not very big place. Uh, here's Herb working it. Keep an eye on that big mass of rock in the background because it appears in pretty much all the photos of the place. Here's a, a rock hounding trip there in the late 60s. Uh, this site was closed by the 80s when those fellas had passed away, unfortunately. Uh, but it reopened in uh, 2015, and uh, clubs can now go there. It's uh, only on a club basis, but um, it's, I think, one of the best places to collect in Connecticut right now, given the variety of things that are there and accessibility. Um, it's a strongly zoned little pegmatite. There's an apolytic zone, which contains a lot of diverse mineralogy. A kind of a, a not so great intermediate zone. And then there's a quartz core and a regular quartz core surrounded by amazonite, as shown in this picture. And the amazonite varies from kind of a pale blue to a pale green. And it's usually kind of partially mottled color, not, not complete throughout the crystal. It's a little hard to get it to show up in photos quite well, but the one on the left shows the partial uh, coloration. That's when I chipped out of the quartz core and had to rebuild. <laughs> uh, but there are pockets there. Uh, here's my friend Dave Bodner uh, after we cleaned the thing out. Um, mostly we found smoky quartz here and a lot of Amazonite rubble. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. There's a there, there are not a lot of large pockets here. Most of them are fairly small. There's a zone where I would describe the rock as more of a sponge where there's a sort of a contiguous zone of multiple tiny little pockets uh, that get bigger and smaller. Uh, but this is just a sample of some of the Smokies that have come out of there, really nice stuff. Uh, this was one day in October, uh, two Octobers ago. Many of uh, the, just like a Gillette, many of the quartzes there are shot through with Elbaite. And what's also shot through with albite, unlike Gillette, is microcline, which is kind of unusual. Uh, and, and both of these minerals come out of that sort of the spongy zone where there's myriad tiny little needle uh, albites. Uh, this is an example of the wall of that zone. You can see what I mean, where it's not like a huge pocket, but it's just space between crystals kind of. Uh, and when you first pull this out, all that all that space is filled with mud and, and 
tiny albite crystal fragments. A couple more examples. Uh, and like Gillette, there's also etched microcline, which can come with or without Clevelandite. And the, uh, the Amazonite is a light blue here on the left. Uh, usually with microcline, it's not. Uh, but then the, I'm sorry, with Clevelandite, but the Clevelandite is light, is light blue, which makes a nice contrast. And if you're really uh, patient, you can sort the Elbaites out of all the mud that comes out of the pockets. They do get in your fingertips, though. Uh, this is these are mostly unterminated fragments, but you can sit down and pluck out the terminated ones and make a little collection if you are patient enough. Uh, on Halloween Day in 2015, uh, a small pocket you can see on the right, not much more than a basketball. Uh, the trick-or-treat pocket was found by a couple of guys, Adam Berludi and, and Jim Smeagol. It produced a lot of chernikite. Uh, we would never seen chernikite this good anywhere else uh, other than Gillette. Well, it's not quite as good, but mostly smaller bundles like this. Um, but the same nice kind of pink, light pink color. And some of it with quartz. And But the best of it was there were also Elbaites of a size and quality not seen since Gillette closed. Uh, many of them encased in Chernikite like this, which we nicknamed Berluti hot dogs. Unfortunately, there weren't many terminated crystals, maybe a half a dozen and then some fragments and aggregates, but still it was a pretty exciting find. Um, and there's a group of guys who've been specimen mining it by basically cutting the floor uh, with hand with uh, hand saws or uh, uh, power saws, I should say. Um, Joe Mazada, the owner, is standing here on the upper right there in the in the maroon T-shirt, supervising. <laughs> Mostly, he just brings food and homemade wine for us. And he was a great guy. He's actually sold it, but the new owners are still letting people in. Um, here's Tony Pila holding the what we call the beer can uh, barrel. This is from the Apolitic Zone. And most of the barrel in there is, is gem rough because it, it does not break out of the matrix easily. Uh, and so really you cut the floor out and you get blocks and you're pretty much going to break these up for gem rough. But they kept this one because it was a nice, a good size one, even though it was split down the middle. Here's some other pieces from the apolytic zone. Most of the gem rough there is, is lightly colored, but there is... Uh, there is aquamarine. Here's some of the stones cut from that uh, material. There are other barrels there. Uh, just like Gillette, there's pale green stuff. There's pink and there's colorless. And there are zone crystals as well with, with uh, pyramidal faces, just like a Gillette. But not nearly as big. And lots of chlorophane as well, um, sometimes associated with fluorapatite, which gives a nice uh, kind of fluorescent color combination as shown here. Uh, there's so much chlorophane there that it's looks like the rock has bled in many cases, especially when it's wet. And uh, a lot of jemmy pieces, and you can even cut stones out of it. These are done by Tony Pila's brother. A few other goodies from there. I like the isometric system and I like crystal forms. So these are some of my favorite things. Microlite uh, showing octahedral and dodecahedral faces mostly. Uh, a chlorophane crystal, which is very rare, fluoresces the, the pale blue green, just like the, uh, the big uh, massive red stuff, but these are very tiny. And then the spezzertine and, and the trapezohedral crystals is very common there as well. Uh, Microlite is one of my favorite things from there. There's zillions of them, mostly very small, but these two are pretty good size. Uh, the best crystals are usually found in the apolytic zone where there's uh, late uh, fluorite that covers them. So you can crumble that stuff away and there's good uh, columbite or microlites underneath. Columbite is there too, only in very small crystals. So again, not the Winthrop locality. 
Uh, here's a three millimeter one embedded in gem barrel. It's very typical. They might get to be maybe a half a centimeter, a little more. That's it. Other oddball things, bismuthite pseudomorphs after bismuthinite. Um, and where there's barrel, there's secondary beryllium minerals like bertrandite. And we also find there are a lot of agillaria, which is noted in a lot of pegmatites, but uh, I like this one that's just filling a void from clearly a hexagonal barrel crystal. And even some polysite, which was recognized mainly because it didn't look like anything else. And uh, just mostly white masses with a little bit of, of uh, purple uh, mica in it. And with that, I have brought you uh, my summary of Hadam Minerals. And I just want to thank Joe Mazzotta for all the good years of uh, collecting at Hewitt and for all the venison he's cooked as shown here. So thank you very much. I'm happy to have done this talk on the last RMS.